Hello, welcome. As he said, I'm here to talk today about developing and shipping LVM and Clang using CMake. My talk's gonna cover a couple different topics today. I'm gonna start by talking about the LVM community's transition from AutoConf to CMake as the primary build system. I'm also gonna walk through an example of how you can use CMake to ship a, a build of Clang and LVM. I'm gonna talk about ways that you can put the build system to work for you, making your workflows more efficient and helping make you more productive. I'm gonna talk a bit towards the end about the current status of the build system, and I'm gonna finish up by talking about some future opportunities for high value improvements. So to start this all off, you know, we had this epic trip to get down to one build system. And the first thing I guess we should talk about is why CMake? So CMake has a couple of nice things. One is it's a cross-platform build configuration tool. This is a little bit distinctly different from how you might think of a normal build system because CMake doesn't actually manage the building. It manages generating and configuring build files that are interpreted by other build systems. Part of what gives this a nice system is that it's, it has a very simple and powerful language for describing the builds so that you can take advantage of really advanced features in build systems. It also has support for uh, IDEs as well as all of the native tools for building on whatever platform you're on. And, and CMake supports building on a lot of platforms. Another really great thing since we're open source here is that it is an open source project and it has an active and, and incredibly responsive uh, open source community. Um, I've actually filed bugs against CMake and frequently found them to have patches and fixes merged within a day. Um, they are really great and several of the members of the CMake community actually are on our mailing lists and they keep track of our project. They keep us honest doing good things in our build system and they're concerned about any of the issues that we encounter. Last thing here is, um, and this one I think is really important, is that CMake has binary and source distributions that are readily available for any platform. Uh, and this is distinctly different from the way we were with AutoConf because we were locked to a very old version of AutoConf that only Eric Christopher had and only Eric Christopher knew how to run. And we all used to send our patches to him. Uh, now we can actually test and, and run the patches ourselves and we can keep iterating on the build system even when Eric is sick. So let me talk a little bit about the CMake language because I, as I said, it was a simple language. So in a really simple example, you'll start out with something that looks like this. The first line here is telling the CMake interpreter what version of CMake you wanna support as your minimum version. But more than that, it also tells the interpreter what version of CMake to behave like. This is important because it means that CMake will behave like this version even if you're using a newer version of it. So we don't actually have to mandate that all of the developers in the community are on the same version. We just have to agree on what our minimum is. The second line here just sets up a project and it sets some basic variables uh, that are used throughout CMake. It's not really important though uh, to this example. <clears throat> Following this a little further, the next thing I do here is I set up a call to add executable. I give it a target named hello world, and I'm giving it the hello world CPP file. At this point, you actually have a full functioning hello world build system. It will build your hello world executable and you'll get it out the other side. Now, if we wanted to make this a little bit more complicated, we can add conditional configurations. So for an example, we can add an if statement on if Unix, which says if you're targeting a Unix platform, and then we add a target compile definition named Unix. Public and private target compile definitions equate to just adding dash D lines to the compiler when you're invoking uh, the, the compile commands during the build. There's also another mode called an interface definition. Interface definitions are useful when you're building a large software project because it's a way that in your configuration of a library, you can say all of the clients of this library must define this define. Uh, we generally don't use them in LVM, but I just wanted to explain it here since I'm calling out the public use. We can make this example a little bit more complicated by saying maybe if you're on Unix, you wanted to add an extra source file. We do this by inserting another conditional 
if Unix, and setting a variable extra sources to unix.cpp. Now, we also then have to pass this into the add executable call, and we can do so by just expanding the variable in the add executable call. The CMake programming language behaves much like shell programming languages, where if the variable is not set, it will uh, evaluate to an empty string, and it is as if it wasn't there. This, using this mechanism allows us to take advantage of uh, CMake's behavior and not duplicate complicated bits of logic because we can make them fold away to nothing by just not setting variables. This is as deep as I'm going to go into the CMake language for now, but I also want to call out that we have some really great resources on LVM.org that talk about the CMake programming language um, and the CMake build system in LVM. The first link here is a primer that talks about the CMake language, and it goes in depth to talk about some of the aspects of the CMake language that are a little bit unintuitive that you might not be familiar with. It also covers some common pitfalls and things that can be problematic when you're setting up build system code. The next link talks about uh, some of the common build settings and configurations that people use with the LVM build system. The last link down here talks about some of the more advanced build configuration options that we have, and it talks about some of the things that I'm going to talk about a little later in my talk. When we started this whole effort to move to CMake, there were some challenges along the way, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what the process involved. So one of the big challenges in, in doing this kind of thing is that the build system is touched by everything, and everything depends on it. When you're talking about removing a build system and replacing it with another one, everyone has to update their bots, everyone has to update their scripts, their workflows, everything, the whole way down. Um, and the reality is we don't have a good mechanism today in LVM for coordinating these kinds of changes. Another thing that was challenging in this process is that the build system is not the most interesting piece of technology. Uh, a lot of people just kind of don't want to think about it. Uh, it's a lot like when you think about sausage. A lot of people, they enjoy sausage, but they don't want to know how the sausage was made. Same logic applies to build systems. A lot of people enjoy software. They really don't want to know how it was made. Another thing that happens whenever you're doing long-running initiatives, and this one took about a year, uh, is that you always get the downstream users that come in right after you say, hey, we're almost done, and they say, yeah, but it doesn't work for me. And here's this giant list of bugs. Um, this happened with CMake as late as the week after we actually committed to Trunk deprecating autoconf. Um, and I think that this is something to think about when you're actually working with an open source project like this where we have a lot of downstream users, is ways to engage the downstream users and try to get these issues surfaced earlier. Uh, I don't really have a good answer to this, um, but I will talk a little bit about something that I did that helped. So let's talk about what worked. Well, first and foremost, the LVM community is fantastic. Uh, this effort never could have happened without the support of the community, people like you. This was a huge initiative. There were hundreds of commits made by lots of people, uh, and we, we really worked very hard for a long time to get this done. And having the community support and having the community behind not just the, the idea of getting down to one build system, but also putting forth effort and coordinating and coming up with technical solutions to hard problems was completely invaluable. Also, one of the things that I did here is I sent out regular status reports. You guys may have seen them on LVM Dev. Those status reports, I think, served a really important purpose because they got people in the community engaged in thinking about this problem as it was coming. And I think that anyone working in the community on an initiative that's taking many months should send status reports. It is a really great way to keep people aware of what's going on so that nobody is surprised. Another thing, and I know this can be a little touchy because we're not all in the Bay Area, but face-to-face -face conversations, whether they're in person or even over the phone or a video chat service, they're really helpful. There's a lot of these issues, you, you know, when you're doing a big project in open source, you'll get tied down in these details that could be technical, they could be political. You need to have the ability to talk with people and, and move a little faster than an email. Uh, one other really great resource is IRC. 
Um, there were a lot of conversations on IRC talking about the build system transition and what it meant. And I strongly recommend if you're doing something large, get involved there. Uh, to give a little idea of what went into this change, um, we fixed a lot of bugs. Uh, this is just a, a limited set of the ones that were actually tracked in Bugzilla. And as we all know, our bug hygiene of tracking issues isn't always great. Uh, we also uh, added a whole bunch of new features to the build system. Um, this is, again, just some of the ones that I saw when I went through the logs. It's by no means an exhaustive list. Um, but if you look at some of these, you'll probably notice that some of these weren't even supported in AutoConf. The CMake build system, one of the things about it that has really impressed me is the fact that people in the community are willing to modify it to make it fit their needs better. And that's really important because it means that the build system is doing a better job of doing the things that we need as a community than what we had before. Now, for the next phase of my talk, I'm gonna kind of focus specifically on these first four features. And I'm gonna talk about them in reference to how they can help you when you're trying to ship LVM and Clang. Now, before I go into that, I wanna talk for a minute about what it means to build a distribution uh, of Clang. So one big thing here is that generally when you build a distribution, you're gonna build Clang in two stages. You're going to build a compiler that runs on your host, and then you're going to use that to build the compiler that you actually wanna ship. Also, when you're building a distribution, you may want to be able to selectively choose which tools from LLVM you're including in the distribution. This is important because not all of the LLVM tools are applicable on all of the platforms we support, and so we need to know which ones we're going to pick. Another thing that happens with shipping a distribution is you probably want to set your, some build configuration settings. Now, these could be optimization settings, or they could be vendor settings. An example of a vendor setting is that we have a setting in CMake that controls the bug reporter URL that Clang prints when it crashes. If you're a company like, say, Apple, you might want to replace that with a link to developer.apple.com instead of a link to the lvm.org bug tracker. For some context here, uh, the test release shell script in lvm.org today is over 500 lines. This is a pretty complicated process, and it's something that I think we have some opportunity to make a lot easier. So let's talk about how we make it simpler. Uh, in CMake, we can build a distribution in just four very simple commands. We start with a CMake command to configure the build. We then build all of the things that we want to distribute. We run check all to test to make sure it works. And we install it. Now, don't squint too hard. I'm going to blow these up so we can talk a little bit more about what they do. So the first one here, the CMake command, is using the Ninja generator. And it's using a CMake cache file named uh, distribution example. This file lives in the Clang tree today. CMake cache files are scripts written in CMake that run before CMake starts evaluating your build settings in, in the top level CMake lists file. And they can set settings on the CMake cache that persist through the build. They're executed in isolated scope. So other than things that they set in the cache, none of the variables you set in them will be exposed anywhere else. So, Let's talk a little bit about CMake's variable scopes because CMake is a little weird in this area. Uh, CMake at the base level has a cache. The cache is, contains variables that are set and persistent across multiple runs of CMake. The CMake cache can be populated using cache scripts, which have their own scope. Additionally, your CMake list at the root of your project has its own scope. And each subdirectory under that file have their own scopes. Also, CMake functions each have scopes, and they can be inserted anywhere in any CMake lists or CMake cache script. One good way to think about this, since we're all used to computer science terms, is that when you enter a scope in CMake, all of the variables that are defined are passed by value into the child scope. This is important because it's, it's a by value passing. So if you change the setting of a variable, it persists downwards into new scopes, but not upwards. 
You can set variables up by using the CMake set commands uh, parent scope option. And you can also, from any point, set a variable in the cache by using the CMake set commands cache option. We generally discourage using cached variables wherever possible because CMake caching has no scheme for invalidation. Uh, you know, cache invalidation being one of those really hard problems to solve in computing, CMake basically doesn't solve it at all. Um, and another note here is there are uh, macros, loops, and conditional statements in CMake, and none of them have their own scope. So anything that you declare in a macro is a variable becomes defined in the scope that called the macro. So now let's go back to my example, and I want to take a quick look here at the CMake cache files that are used in the build that I described. So the first one is this distribution example CMake cache that lives under the Clang repository under the CMake caches directory. So the file looks something like this, and it starts out by setting the targets to build to be the native target. The native target is a special placeholder in the build system that represents the target that compiles code for your host. We also define that we want to build a release build because we want an optimized compiler. We're specifying a vendor setting here that is to set the vendor as lvm.org. And we're setting on the bootstrap build, which is the next stage in the build that we want to enable LTO. When enabling LTO in multi-stage builds, you actually have to set it up in the stage before you want to use LTO so that that stage knows that it needs to build all the corresponding tools for LTO builds, and it needs to make sure that the next stage depends on those tools. The next thing I do here is I list a series of targets that I want to expose from the next stage build into the build that we're generating and I set up the configuration that I want to use for the next stage build. Now, the first option here just enables the bootstrap, which is the generating the next stage, and the second option here sets the CMake options that are used when uh, Ninja ends up invoking CMake to configure the next stage. Now, let's take a look at that other CMake cache file, that stage 2.1. It also lives in Clang's source directory right next to the other cache file, and it looks something like this. In this cache file, we start by setting the optimization uh, settings as release with debug info. We do this because we probably want to have debug info for the build that we're shipping in case we want to do post-mortem debugging of any crashes that come in. We also are setting here the optimization levels as 03, And then we go into this next step where I'm saying that I only want to install the LVM toolchain tools, and I'm defining a specific list of tools that I'm defining as the toolchain tools. And then the last thing down here is I specify the components from the build that I want to distribute. These are components like Clang, LTO, the Clang headers, the runtime libraries, the built-ins, and then also all of those tools that I defined earlier as the LVM tools. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this presents itself in its workflow, but this is how we control only building and installing the things that we care about. So let's come back to these commands. The next command here is the one that does the building of the things we care about. All of the commands that are prefixed with stage and a number are commands that are targets from later build stages exposed up through the top level build. When you run this command, you're going to end up building Clang twice, once as the host compiler, and then once using that host compiler to build the one you want to ship. This workflow enables very complex multi-stage builds through simple interfaces for the users. The distribution target is the special purpose target that is generated comprised of the components that we specified earlier using the LVM distribution components variable. This really allows you to build only the things that you care about, and it can be a really big win for building your distributions. So coming back out at the commands, the next one in the line is, I think, pretty self-explanatory. 
It runs the check all target on the stage two build and runs all the tests. The last one down here gets a little interesting again because it exposes something important about how the distribution target works. This does what you would think where it installs the components that you built in the distribution. It requires that every component that you specified in your list not only represents the target that builds what you want, but it also has to have a corresponding install target. This target is basically just an aggregate of all of the targets that are named install-component for all of the components that you specified. And that's it. Four commands, and you've built and installed a distribution. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the other features of the build system that can make you more productive. So when talking about boosting productivity with the build system, the first thing I feel that I need to mention here is Tillman Schiller's Euro LVM talk from last year. Uh, he gave a really great set of suggestions of things that you can do to make building LVM and Clang more efficient. I'm gonna go over some of these things and, and dig into how the build system enables you to do them. So first of all, uh, use a host compiler that is optimized with PGO and LTO. Also, you wanna use a fast linker. If you're on Darwin, LD64 is recommended. If you're on Linux or FreeBSD, LLD or Gold are really fast linkers if they work for you. Also, when you're doing incremental builds, there's an option in the build system, LVM build shared equals on. You can specify this to generate all of the LVM libraries as shared libraries instead of static archives. This has some impact on the performance of the final binary that you generate, so you wouldn't want to ship like this, but it is really great for iteration because you end up building and linking less as you iterate. Now, some other things that we can do with the build system to boost productivity include things like the LVM optimized table gen flag. This allows you to build an optimized table gen to pair with your debug build. We also generally can just build less stuff. If you only care about certain tools, building just the tools you care about is a good way to reduce the amount of work the build system needs to do. We also have if you're using one of the command line build tools like Make or Ninja, we generate a bunch of targets that test each individual subdirectory in the LVM and Clang test suites, not the whole test suite. This is really great for iterations because it allows you to, to test just the things that are related to what you're changing. Also, use Ninja. Ninja is a really fast, really lightweight build system. It's wonderful for incremental builds. I strongly would recommend that everyone be using Ninja. And if they're available to you, object file caching and distributed build tools can also make a really big win. Now I wanna dig in for a minute about PGO and how the build system can enable you to build a PGO'd Clang very simply. You can see here, it's two commands. We start by using another one of those CMake cache files that live under the Clang directory and then we just run the stage two command. Now, this is a very complicated build underneath the hood. The PGO build actually builds three stages. The first is the stage one compiler that's your host compiler with the full profile runtime. The second is the stage two instrumented compiler built with the stage one compiler. And then the third is the fully optimized compiler using the profile data that's generated from the instrumented build and using the the stage one compiler to build it. This whole workflow takes a long time, but it gets a really great result at the end. There's also a target that's generated that's quite longly named, uh, stage two instrumented generate prof data. Uh, this target is really useful if you wanted to set up a bot that generates profile data, because it's, it generates the stage one and the stage two instrumented compiler. It then runs the instrumentation tasks to generate the profile data, and then it stops. This is great so that you could set up a bot that actually runs the profile data over and over again, 
uploading it to a server, and your engineers could just download it from there. If we wanted to add LTO into the mix, it's also very simple. By adding the dash D PGO instrument LTO equals on option before the CMake cache, this is important because these arguments are order dependent, uh, we will enable LTO on both the instrumented and the final build. Running this build takes a really, really long time. But the compiler that you get out the other side is as well optimized as we can get it. Now, when I talked about building less earlier, let me give you some concrete examples of what that means. So in the simplest case, it's building only the projects you care about. If you're not working on Clang, or you're not working on LDB, or you're not working on LLD, just don't include them in your source tree, and you won't build them. Also, you might not care about all the LVM backends. We keep getting more of them every year, and maybe you only care about one or two. You can disable all of the backends that you don't care about by just building the, or by using the LVM uh, targets to build option. Also, as I said earlier, every subdirectory in the LVM and Clang trees have test targets that run just the tests under those subdirectories. This is things like you can run check LVM code gen or check LVM code gen ARCH64 to run just the tests in those subdirectories. This is really useful when you're iterating because running just the limited subset of tests is way faster than running them all. And lastly, you know, I mentioned that distribution target earlier. You can use that in your workflows as well as when you're shipping a distribution. You can use it as a shortcut for building the tools that you care about, and because our dependencies are pretty well expressed in CMake, you'll only build the things that actually contribute to the, to the components that you specify. Now let's talk for a little bit about the status of the current build system. So we're currently not tracking any features from AutoConf that are missing in CMake. We also are not tracking any downstream users who haven't migrated or have had any problems migrating that haven't been addressed. Did I mention AutoConf is gone? There's also ongoing work to clean up compiler RT, in particular looking at the support for cross-targeting different architectures. And we have a new runtime subdirectory in the LVM project that's designed to help building the runtime libraries for your targets, and that is beginning to take shape. Additionally, the LDB build system has been getting support for Darwin, and that's going along quite well. Now let's talk for a little bit about some of the high value improvements that I think we can make to the build system. Now I should preface this with, uh, this is like all things, a giant laundry list of things that I've thought of. Uh, I'm hoping that sometime I'll actually have time to do these, but if not, please help. So one of the big areas that we can improve things is having accurate dependencies expressed in the build system. We currently, Although we have all of these targets for all the subdirectories under the, the test directory to run just limited sets of tests, all of those targets actually depend on all of the tools used anywhere in the test suite. Uh, that really actually hurts the ability to go from a clean build, or even in some cases, some of your iterations. Having the ability to have the, each of those targets model the dependencies of just the things they care about would be a huge win for the project. Also, we're really bad about how we model the dependencies of table gen. Uh, we have a hack in the build system today that after you run table gen, you compare it against the last output generated from table gen and only copy it over if it's actually changed. And it's, it's a crazy hack. It saves us a lot of time, but it would be nice if we actually had accurate dependencies feeding into the table gen builds and coming out of them, because then we could actually do a better job of culling the build tree when table gen needs to regenerate. Another thing that we're working on is this idea of improving the runtime builds. One of the things that we need to do here is we need to continue expanding the existing support with the goal of being able to have a single CMake command that builds a full tool chain with the runtime libraries and all the runtimes for the platform. Now, 
one of the other things here is that we should really only be configuring the runtimes for one target at a time. Uh, the fact that we don't do that today in some of the runtime projects really puts us at odds with the way CMake is designed to handle cross-targeting, and it's been a real problem in the build system. Now, I'm not saying that we need to invoke CMake multiple times from the user perspective to get runtimes for multiple targets. We should just hide that in the build system so that you can configure CMake once and tell the top level build, hey, I want the runtimes for these five targets. And it should be able to hide the fact that it's invoking CMake multiple times behind uh, Ninja tasks. Another area of improvements that I, I wanted to bring up here is it's just some general goodness, some areas that we can make things better. Uh, one area is adding in-tree PGO test data. Uh, today, we actually have one PGO test entry, um, and it is a Hello World C++ file that I wrote. Uh, if anyone wants to throw some good tests in there, that'd be great. Um, now, also, the PGO test data, if you're working downstream, doesn't have to be in tree. Um, we drive it with lit, so if you have your own test data that's very platform specific, you can drop that in in your own repository, and just dropping it in, it should work. Another area that I think is kind of important is that we should have some tests for the build system. Uh, we're in a very un-LVM situation today with the build system where the build system is completely and totally untested. Uh, I think there's some interesting opportunity for how we can use lit to test the build system. Uh, and I've been talking with Nico about the idea of extending Ninja uh, to help make us able to do this better. Um, also, one of the things that I've talked to some of the people maintaining bots out there about is this idea of changing the bot configurations to be driven with CMake caches. As I showed earlier, CMake caches are a really simple way of expressing complex configurations. One of the challenges that we often have with building and reproducing issues that occur on bots is matching the configuration of the bots. Uh, in particular with CMake, this can be hard because a lot of the bots don't run CMake on every time they run through. And so you may have to go sifting through 100 or 150 old builds before you find one that actually has the CMake command. If we migrated these configurations to, to CMake cache files, we could actually have a place in the repository where we put the CMake cache files that, uh, for the bots, and they could match the names of the bots. So if you wanted to reproduce a configuration of a bot, you can just pass in a single CMake cache file and have it reproduce the bots configuration. Another thing I've been thinking about is LVM build. You guys may have some experience with LVM build.txt files and how every once in a while they weirdly break something. Uh, we actually have the dependency graph of all the libraries in LVM expressed in two places, once in CMake and once in LVM build.txt. This was really important when we had two build systems because it was a way to keep them in sync and it was a way to, to have the ability to generate LVM config that needs this dependency information from uh, autoconf. Today, CMake has all this information. It even has it in a way that we can query. So we could actually get rid of LVM build.txt by having CMake generate the information that goes into LVM config. I think this would be a really big win for the community because I'm not sure that LVM build today is actually getting us anything. A last note that I have here in my list of things is that Ninja or CMake 3.6 added a feature, uh, CMake Ninja Output Path Prefix. Uh, it's kind of weirdly named, but what it really does is it allows CMake to generate a Ninja file that's designed to be included inside of another Ninja file. What's kind of cool about this is that with a little bit more support from CMake, I think we can get to the point where we could actually have a single Ninja file that represents the full build graph for some of these really complicated builds that I'm showing. That way we don't have to call Ninja recursively to do multi-stage builds or to build the runtimes. I think this would be a really neat opportunity for us, uh, and I think it's something that we should keep an eye on as a community because it could radically simplify and improve the performance of our builds. And any questions, anyone? <laughs> so we are, we are right on time. We have five minutes for questions.
I can you say a little bit about uh, any available cross-reference tools for CMake? I, I find as a CMake newbie, I spend a lot of time with grep, and what I'd really like is something that would sort of immediately point me to the definitions and uses of interesting things in CMake. Uh, <laughs> actually, I use grep. Um, so, <laughs> really sorry. Uh, I, I do have to say, though, one thing uh, that, that might help you in, in looking at some of these things is that CMake actually has phenomenal documentation online. Uh, so if you're if you're looking at like actual CMake built-in variables or CMake functionality that, that are functions provided by CMake or the modules that are part of the package, their their online documentation is absolutely wonderful. Uh, to add to that, um, why it's not cross-referenced, uh, it's better than grab. There's lvm-cs.pcc.me.uk, which is uh, Peter Collingborn's code search for LVM. It has cross references for all the C++ files and it has like a search box so you can like fairly quickly jump through the CMake files too. But it's not clicky. Oh, that's cool. Oh. <laughs> Chris? Yes. Oh. oh, is there any general badness for you in CMake? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so CMake, you may have noticed my first slide. It's okay, okay. Does <laughs> uh, <that> anything? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In make files, whenever I can't figure out what's going on, I just go in and define shell equals sh-x, so I see every single command that it's doing under the hood. Is there anything similar in CMake that helps you kind of debug things when they're not doing what you want? Uh, well, so it kind of depends on what you're looking for. So in terms of like the make file, like listing all of the commands that it's executing, uh, that is provided functionality by the build tools that you're generating for. So if you're generating make files, you still have that capability. Um, you also can, can do similar things with Ninja, uh, where you can do like the dash V flag gives the full commands that it's running and all that. Um, in the CMake side, uh, CMake has the ability that you can print messages. And so if you ever want to like debug some weird behavior, inserting print you know, message calls to, to print out messages and variables is a really great way to do it. Um, some of the CMake behaviors can be a little bit difficult to, to reverse engineer and figure out what's going on, uh, especially if you hit bugs in CMake. Um, so one of the things that I frequently do is uh, Ninja's build description files are, although very verbose, they're very simple to read. And so I will frequently generate a Ninja file and actually walk back from the commands in the Ninja file and, and see if I can figure out how it's generated. Um, I also frequently read the CMake source code because it's actually pretty clean C++, so it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on. Yes, yes, and, and actually there's also, there's a debug flag in CMake, so CMake generates if, if it's going weird in some of the checks and things that it does, uh, CMake does generate pretty verbose logs. And there's an, uh, some of those logs get deleted to save disk space uh, if nothing goes wrong. But there's also an option where you can tell it to keep the logs uh, even if there's no errors. Hey, uh, so I'm not sure if you caught it, but there was a uh, talk yesterday on LL build. It seems somewhat related. Uh, do you have any comments uh, relating to that? <laughs> so uh, LL build is, uh, you can kind of think of it as a replacement for Ninja. Um, in fact, Daniel said during his talk yesterday that you can actually run it as if it were Ninja. Um, it is an in-development project. Uh, there's some very lofty goals. Uh, I think probably Daniel's better to ask some questions about that because I'm not really involved in that effort. Um, but I would certainly encourage you to take a look at it and try it and see how it works for you. Uh, so for the uh, cache files, uh, yes. 
is the recommendation for individual vendors to commit those directly into Clang or to keep them downstream? Uh, so uh, it, it's kind of up to you. Um, we actually have uh, a set of cache files in uh, Clang that match pretty closely to how uh, we build the Clang that we ship at Apple. Um, those files, they're named Apple Stage 1 and Apple Stage 2.cmake. Uh, one of the nice things for, for, for the people at Apple that are working mostly upstream uh, is that we now have a way that we can reproduce our packaged builds against the open source tree without layering anything on. Um, that said, CMake cache files aren't like crazy conflicting out of tree things, so it really is up to you. Um, one of the things that I would say is, is, could be a tipping point to say yes, put them in tree, is if you have bots using them. Because if you have bots using them, uh, being able to point at them and say, hey, if you configure with this, you'll reproduce our failure on this bot, um, that's a huge win. Okay, I think we are, it's the end. The presentation. Let's uh, thank you again, our speaker. Thank you.